Last week, the media was filled with commentary regarding the resignation of Mr. Andrew Thorburn as the CEO of the Essendon Football Club after just one day in the job. Uh, previously, Mr. Thorburn had been the CEO of the National Australia Bank, but it wasn't his leadership of the bank or the adverse findings of the Royal Commission into misconduct in the banking superannuation and financial services industry that were the issue. It was his involvement with his local church. Uh, politicians, church leaders, sports people, journalists, lawyers and many others have proffered their opinions on television, in newspapers and on social media. It has been quite a story. Even the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is visiting Australia at the moment, was asked about it. Now just to recap, what caused concern to the board of the Essendon Football Club was Mr Thorburn's involvement with the city on a hill church where he is the chairman of the board. Now in the hours after his appointment as CEO was announced, uh, comments made in a sermon by the pastor of his church in 2013 were publicised on social media. And the comments, while strong, were completely in line with historic Orthodox Christian teaching concerning abortion and homosexuality. Uh, the church's teaching and Mr Thorburn's appointment rapidly became a major news story with several prominent figures, including the Premier of Victoria, weighing in. This was what the Premier said on Tuesday about the church's teaching. Uh, those views are absolutely appalling. I don't support those views, that kind of intolerance, that kind of hatred, bigotry. It is just wrong. To dress that up as anything other than bigotry is just obviously false. Now, after a day of media attention and commentary like this, the Essendon board informed Mr Thorburn that he could not be the chairman of the City on a Hill Church and the CEO of the football club. And Mr Thorburn chose to resign as CEO. And this is some of what he said in a statement that followed his resignation. It became clear to me that my personal Christian faith is not tolerated or permitted in the public square, at least by some and perhaps by many. I was being required to compromise beyond a level that my conscience allowed. Despite my own leadership record, within hours of my appointment being announced, the media and leaders of our community had spoken. They made it clear that my Christian faith and my association with the church are unacceptable in our culture if you wish to hold a leadership position in society. And this is part of the statement given by the chairman of the Essendon Football Club explaining their actions. As soon as the comments relating to a 2013 sermon from a pastor at the City on a Hill Church came to light this morning, we acted immediately to clarify the publicly espoused views on the organisation's official website, which are in direct contradiction to our values as a club. Essendon is committed to providing an inclusive, diverse and a safe club where everyone is welcome and respected. The board made clear that Despite these not being views that Andrew Thorburn has expressed personally and that were also made prior to him taking up his role as chairman, he couldn't continue to serve in his dual roles at the Essendon Football Club and as chairman of City on a Hill. The board respects Andrew's decision. We are deeply committed to our values and support wholeheartedly the work of the AFL in continuing to stamp out any discrimination based on race, sex, religion, gender, sexual identity or orientation, or physical or mental disability. I want to stress that neither the board nor Andrew was aware of the comments from the 2013 sermon until we read about them this morning. I also want to stress that this is not about vilifying anyone for their personal religious beliefs, but about a clear conflict of interest with an organisation whose views do not align at all with our values as a safe, inclusive, diverse and welcoming club for our staff, our players, our members, our fans, our partners and the wider community. Now, the reason I mention all of that is uh, not because I want to get into a discussion about religious freedom. I am sure there are other Christian leaders far better equipped than me who will provide commentary on that aspect of the story. 
But I mention it because it seems to me to illustrate so clearly the way that many people today think about love. Uh, the words of Premier Andrews con condemning the teaching of the church and the statement from the Essendon Football Club are representative of the concept of love that is ascendant in our culture. It is an understanding of love that leads some people to see traditional Christian teaching as being unloving and even hateful. Love is increasingly thought of in terms of acceptance, inclusion and safety. And not just physical safety, but emotional and psychological safety. These are at the top of the list. This is what it means to love an individual or a group. It is to accept them and include them and affirm them in whatever ways they express their identity. Uh, failure to do that is hurtful and even hateful. It's not loving. Well, as Christians, we would agree that love does involve these things. Acceptance, inclusion, safety, and not being prejudiced. Uh, for example, we want love to flourish in our fellowship, and that means we want our church to be a place where people feel welcomed, where they feel safe, where they are not discriminated against because of their race or their skin colour, or because of a physical or mental disability. But the issue we have as followers of Jesus is the emphasis placed upon these things such that they overshadow and even exclude other considerations, other aspects of love. It is increasingly the case that the way our culture thinks about love is unbalanced. It's disordered and it's ultimately damaging. The Bible, God's Word, presents us with a much more holistic and healthy idea of love. An idea of love that is true, but that more and more is at odds with the modern understanding. And that's what we're going to consider this morning as we begin this series of sermons from Paul's letter to the Philippians. We're going to cover the first 11 verses of chapter 1, focusing particularly on verses 9 and 10. Uh, I'm not going to give you an introduction to the book. Uh, you can read about the founding of the church at Philippi in Acts chapter 16 if you'd like. If you have a study Bible, there's probably a nice little introduction there for you to read before the text of chapter 1. And of course there is a whole library of resources available online if you want to study the background of this letter. The main thing to know is that the Apostle Paul planted the church in Philippi and as will come through very clearly in our reading, he had a deep affection for it. So please follow along in your Bible as I read aloud Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defence and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record. How greatly I long after you in all the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That you may approve things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that by the good and holy work of your Spirit, you would help us to under understand the text of Scripture before us. We ask that your Spirit would be our teacher today. Pray that he would instruct us, correct us if that be our need, and encourage us. 
And again, this we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now Paul penned this letter to the church at Philippi during the two years he was under house arrest in Rome. We read about that in the final chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, the church at Philippi began with just one person, a woman named Lydia, who Paul met as she prayed by the river. Now the reference to bishops and deacons there in verse 1 is evidence that the church had grown and was organised. It had its own leaders. And what is so striking about this opening section is how expressive Paul is about his feelings towards them. He tells the church that he thanks God every time he remembers them, verse 3. He makes requests for them with joy, verse 4. He has them in his heart. I love that expression in verse 7. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. That's beautiful. He calls God as his witness that he longs for them greatly, verse 8. Paul spoke to the Philippians in a manner that is unique to this letter. He didn't address any of the other churches he wrote to with such tenderness and affection. So where did this come from? Well, perhaps it was because the church had been birthed in such difficult and yet miraculous circumstances. If you remember the story, Paul was beaten and imprisoned in Philippi. And then after an earthquake, his jailer was converted. You know, what must I do to be saved? His jailer was converted and his family. I'm sure Paul looked back with fondness on those incredible experiences and maybe that's why this church had such a special place in his heart. But I think his affection for this church also sprang from another source. It's clear that the Philippians took it upon themselves to help Paul. In verse 5 he speaks of their fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. This is a reference to their participation and their partnership in the gospel. It refers to their support for Paul and for his ministry, which included financial assistance. Uh, Paul talks about this towards the end of chapter 4, if you want to quickly turn over there. Chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, Paul says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only, verse 16, for even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. In other words, over and again you, you met my physical needs. Now they consistently sent him clothing or food or money. The Christians in Philippi really cared about Paul. They laboured together with him for the sake of the gospel through prayer and encouragement and practical help. They loved him and he loved them. Really, it's no surprise that Paul's heart was for them. It's no surprise that when he thought about them, he was filled with thanksgiving and with joy. We also see in this opening section that Paul was sure that they would grow and go forward in the Christian life. He was sure that the Lord would bring to completion what he had started in their lives. Now verse 6 is worthy of a sermon all by itself, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, as with many of Paul's letters, the opening paragraphs contain a prayer for those that he was writing to. The first part of this prayer is what I want to focus on with you this morning. Look please once again at the text, verses 9 and 10. Paul says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ. Why did Paul pray this way for the Philippians? Why make this request about their love? I mean, they seem to be on the right track, at least when it came to loving Paul. Well, if we quickly look over to chapter 4, we see that not all was well in the fellowship. Uh, there was some interpersonal conflict going on, so much so that Paul mentioned two people by name. It's 
A striking feature of this epistle that he, he named these people. Chapter 4, verse 2. I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And we're not told what these two women were disagreeing about. But the fact that they are named suggests that whatever the issue was, the unity of the church was at risk. Now Paul was hundreds and hundreds of kilometres away in Rome and yet reports had come back to him about this difference of opinion, this dispute. So it must have been very serious. Perhaps people were starting to take sides and big trouble was on the horizon. Also, if you look back to chapter 2 verses 1 to 3, you know, perhaps there were some other issues beginning to rumble. Perhaps there was friction between certain individuals or groups. Uh, Paul appeals to them. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfil ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. That Paul had to say this might indicate that there was some strife and some vain glory in the church, that they were not of one accord. So maybe this prayer concerning their love was timely. Maybe it was appropriate given what was happening in their midst. This prayer has some very important things to teach us about love. This morning we're going to consider just two things, two points. Okay, very long introduction, very brief body, okay? Two things, two points. I'll give them to you up front. We learn here that number one, Christian love is different. Number two, Christian love is discerning. Christian love is different and Christian love is discerning. And so first of all, note with me that Christian love is different. This is the part of the opening section of the letter that really caught my attention and, and was the genesis of this sermon. When we think about the Christian concept of love, uh, the true concept of love, being very different to how our culture thinks about love, it's seen right here in verse 9. This is not what a modern secular person would pray. As someone who embraces the contemporary idea of love, were they to pray in this fashion, would probably say, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in acceptance and inclusion, so that all feel welcome, affirmed and safe. This idea that love would include, let alone abound in knowledge and judgment, is so foreign to the way our culture thinks. And even from a Christian perspective, this is striking. We might have expected Paul to say, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in generosity and encouragement, or in patience and compassion, but that's not what he wrote here. His prayer was that their love would abound yet more and more, that it would be ever increasing in knowledge and judgment. This is interesting, don't you think? The question that naturally arises is knowledge of what? Love that abounds yet more and more in, in knowledge of what? What subject? Well, I think the answer lies in the prayer that Paul prayed for the Christians at Colossae. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We see a similar thing in Paul's prayer for the Christians at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 15 to 17. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Given what Paul said in his prayers for these churches and what he said elsewhere in his letters, it seems fairly obvious that he wanted the Philippians' love to abound more and more in the knowledge of God and his will. 
And that knowledge was there for them to receive with the help of the Holy Spirit through the Holy Scriptures. Their love would abound more and more in the knowledge of God as they gave attention to his word. As they meditated on the message that Paul had preached to them about Jesus and about the new life that was theirs in him. This knowledge would inform their love, regulate their love and direct its expression. This knowledge would help them to know how to show love, real love. Sometimes we don't know, isn't that right? Uh, we've all had the experience where we thought we were doing the loving thing. You know, we, we went with our, our heart and we did what we felt was right and it turned out to be a total disaster. It wasn't the right thing. It, it didn't help that person. It didn't improve the relationship. It didn't bring uplift and blessing. Rather, it brought pain and confusion. We lacked knowledge. And then I'm sure there have been other occasions when we genuinely had no idea how to show love. You've been there? I have. What do I do? I love them. But my heart says do this and my brain says do that and so and so thinks I should do something else. I want to help them. I certainly don't want to make things worse, but I just don't know what to do. I don't know how to love them. We need knowledge. We need guidance. We need instruction from someone who does know. And if anyone knows, it's the one who created us. The one who is love. And as Christians, I think we understand this. Or at least I hope we do. The world doesn't understand this. The world refuses to acknowledge this. But by God's grace, we see our deficiency. We know that in and of ourselves, we have a very imperfect understanding of what love is and how to show it. We recognise that our heart, being fallen and corrupted by sin, often misdirects us when it comes to love. We get it all wrong. We know that our feelings aren't the best or the safest guide. They are not reliable. And they change. That's the truth about us. That's why we need knowledge. Knowledge from God. The knowledge of God. But it wasn't just knowledge that Paul prayed for, it was also judgment. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Now this is the only time this Greek word appears in the New Testament. The one translated judgment. And it has to do with perception. And this is not the judge making decisions in a court. This is the judgment that we make with our senses, you know, with our eyes and our ears. In context, one scholar defines it this way. This is sensitive moral perception. Sensitive moral perception. It's the ability to perceive right and wrong, good and bad. And we can see how this goes hand in hand with knowledge. This is, if you will, the outworking of knowledge as we exercise love. We know the truth, and it helps us to perceive or have insight into what is right and wrong, what is healthy and unhealthy. Here again, I am struck by how countercultural this is. The modern idea of love is that you refrain from making these assessments and merely accept and affirm. To love someone is not to make any value judgments about them or the way they express themselves. In many cases, these categories of right and wrong, good and bad, healthy, unhealthy, are, are actually harmful. Or so we're supposed to believe. When the modern secular person thinks of love, they don't tend to think of it including or involving sensitive moral perception. I mean, that, that kind of thing might well be unloving. Christian love is so very different. It is full of the knowledge of God and it is concerned with morality, with perceiving what is right and what is wrong. That leads us to the second point in the sermon and it continues the flow of thought. Christian love is different and Christian love is discerning. Verse 10 begins with the word that. 
It indicates the purpose for which Paul prayed this way about their love. It was so that the Philippian Christians would be able to approve things that are excellent. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that he may approve things that are excellent. Now we could spend a lot of time unpacking this expression. Uh, the language is very rich in meaning. We're not going to do that. <laughs> the basic idea is that of discernment. The word translated approve has its origins in the tests that were applied to metals to ensure they were genuine. This is testing or verifying what is excellent, you know, what is best. Christian love, full of knowledge and judgment, enables a person to do this, to discern what is excellent, what is best, and that is what they move towards. That is what they choose to do in respect of that person. I'll give you a very basic example by way of illustration. Now the parents in this room uh, could make their children happy at least for a while by letting them eat whatever they want, by letting them have as much screen time as they want, by letting them stay up as late as they want, by letting them decide whether they go to school or not, or do their homework, or clean their room. I'm sure the children would enjoy that, at least for a good while. But love, real love, informed by knowledge, discerns that even though that might make them happy, it's not what's best for them. It discerns that this approach is not excellent because it hinders them in learning and developing that which is necessary for their well-being into adolescence and adulthood. It gets in the way of them developing self-control and patience and many other essential character traits and skills. Love discerns what is best for its object and that's what it seeks. And so in this case, we parents don't indulge our children's every want and whim. We don't give them total control over the running of their lives. We don't accept and affirm all of their choices. And so it is with Christian love. Informed by the knowledge of God, informed by the truth that flows from the creator of all things, it discriminates, it discerns the true from the false, the good from the bad the healthy from the unhealthy. It discerns what matters and what doesn't and it behaves accordingly. Sometimes it says no. Sometimes it acts contrary to the feelings of the heart. Sometimes it even humbles and hurts. Because what has it discerned? What is it seeking? Things that are excellent. That which is best. Christian love is not always safe in the modern sense because it's more concerned about authentic safety and everlasting safety. It seeks true human flourishing now and in eternity. And when it is practiced, when love like this is the norm for Christians and in the Christian community, it has a marvellous effect. Look please at the second half of verse 10. That ye may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ. The Greek word translated sincere means to be without mixture, you know, unalloyed, unadulterated, undiluted, pure. The expression without offence means to be blameless. That is, there is nothing that causes others to stumble. The effect of Christian love is purity of life and of reputation. It's sanctifying. It prepares God's people for the day when Christ returns and calls them home. Now, this is Christian love. And I would imagine that nothing I've said in this sermon will have surprised you. I think we recognise the difference to that which the world promotes and practices. But by way of conclusion, I want to address a danger in what I've set before you today and then finish with some application. The danger is this. It's having an attitude that sees what I've just described as relating to the world out there, that when we love those outside of the Christian community, that's when this discernment and knowledge comes into it. 
we can become quite adept at discerning what's wrong out there in the world. We're quick to discern what is unhealthy and unwise. We have no problem in love calling out what is wrong and corrupt and broken in the media, in politics and in the sexual ethics of our culture. We can earnestly desire that which is best for our society and work towards it and that's fine but that's not what Paul was talking about in this text. He wasn't talking about out there though that's implied. He was talking about in here. He was talking to the Christian community, to a local church, primarily about their love for one another. That's the context. He was thinking about the Philippians and what was going on in their fellowship. He was probably thinking about the whole situation with Iodius and Syntyche and the potential for terrible strife and division. We must not miss this. We must not. We are called to love one another by Christ himself. And this is how. Our love for each other is to be full of knowledge and judgment. We discern what is best and we act accordingly. Sometimes that means we say exactly what we feel. We should do that, brothers and sisters. We should speak from our heart to one another like Paul did here in this letter. We should tell each other what we mean to each other and that we love each other. And sometimes it means we, we don't express our feelings because that's not what's best. That would be selfish and needlessly hurtful. Our feelings are not in line with the Spirit of God. As I heard someone say recently, never miss an opportunity to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> that very well might be the loving thing to do. <coughs> To show Christian love in here means that sometimes we don't insist on what we want and we give way to others because we recognise that that is what is best for that person or for the fellowship as a whole. That is the excellent thing to use Paul's language. To show Christian love means that we help each other not only in ways that might suit us or that are comfortable for us or that might make us look good but in whatever way is best for that person. And it means we're prepared to speak the truth even when it's hard or uncomfortable. Now, brothers and sisters, let's be wary of this danger. This countercultural love that Paul describes is not just for the relationships we have with people out there, it's for our relationships in here, in the family of God. By this, Jesus said, shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. This is so important for us and for our witness to the world. May God help us. May God bless the preaching of his word. Amen.